it's so, there's such a high charge of, of judgment or negativity or just this feeling of, of wrongness, of, of, that there was somebody who was wronged or there's, it's just like, just plain wrong and then the mind just kind of goes into this state where it just feels like that forgiveness uh, would be like uh, just glossing over something, like over something that was, you know, really a, a crime or really a, a, a real offense. So, in the workbook of A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, your one remaining difficulty is that you believe that you must forgive what is true and real. That you must forgive the true. And uh, when you first read it, it's like, what was he talking about, you know? And yet, he's, he works it into, well, actually, the truth is true and only the truth is true. It almost sounds like you're back in kindergarten and he's giving you this ABC stuff. What is this? The truth is true and only the truth is true. So he breaks it down, he says, the first part of the statement, the truth is true, is real, and you have to accept the second part of the statement for the first part to be true. You can't have exceptions and for the truth to be true. The truth is true and only the truth is true. Uh, so, with difficulties with forgiveness, in particular situations, like if there's a grievance over a particular situation, it's like the mind has just adopted a stance where it's saying, oh no, uh, this, this really happened, there was a real mistreatment that occurred, a, a real abuse, or whatever, a real crime, and so on and so forth, and and the mind gets just locked into this fixed position where it's like saying, no, I, I will not budge uh, on this on this particular situation, you know, it, it could have been different, uh, it, it could have been better, uh, or there needs to be, someone's got to have to make amends, you know, they're going to, I'm not going to take uh, the first step, uh, they're going to have to, <laughs> They're going to have to call me, contact me, they're going to have to forgive me before I forgive. You know, it could be any one of those kind of things. But it's just the basic lesson where the mind still has made a hierarchy of illusions and therefore denied that they're all equally the same illusion. And then it's, in this hierarchy, it's made some as uh, very negative illusions, or unforgivable illusions, or whatever. Some that it's kind of indifferent about, and some that it's like, oh yeah, I can, I can let those go. And uh, the teachings are that there's no order of difficulty in miracles, and there's no hierarchy of illusions, that they're all the same. And that's why with Jesus, it didn't matter whether somebody, you know, seemed to be blind, or deaf, or have, uh, you know, leprosy, or they seem to be dead, <laughs> like with Lazarus, <laughs> kind of severe form of sickness. Oh, he's dead. He's been, unavailable. He's, he's unavailable. He's been in the grave for three days, and he's got his grave clothes on, and he smells to the high heavens. Uh, he's deader than, than death. Uh, oh, no order of difficulty in miracles. Lazarus, come forth. Uh, you know, it's like, that's a pretty extreme uh, teaching example, actually. Uh, but, but that was showing again that it's like, it, with the power of God, uh, nothing's impossible, you know. Or if God is with us, who can be against us, is kind of the way that it was said in the Bible. Mm -hmm. so, so those are more extreme cases, but, but yet, like you're saying, Sue, you come back to, okay, what do I have, what's on my plate to practice with, you know. Um, I'll tell you a story about the the people that brought the course, Helen Shuckman and Bill Thedford, uh, one of the original four is a friend of mine, uh, Judy Scutch, and she told me about the, the day that Bill Thedford made his transition, or, or seemed to leave this earth. He was one of the first two Course in Miracles students on the planet. Helen and him had to, they went along taking down the notes and, you know, doing the shorthand and getting, taking down the course, and Jesus kind of, at some point, after they'd done a number of chapters, Jesus was, <clears throat> you have to study the notes. <laughs> oh, study the notes! Oh, yeah! It's like, you know, you ask for a better way, you ask for another way, study the notes. So, 
Bill did. He, he actually became quite a, a demonstration as, over the years, after he retired from his profession and really worked with the Course. But uh, Judy was telling me, Judy Sketch was saying that she had invited Jerry Jampolsky and, and Bill to come up for lunch, and uh, he, Bill was down in Southern California, in La Jolla or San, San Diego. So they were supposed to be up there like around noon for lunch, and she prepared the meal. She was all ready for him and everything, and noon time came, they weren't there. She was very angry. One o'clock came, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. She was furious. She had prepared this meal, and they were probably just having a bunch of holy encounters, uh, <coughs> having a ball together, coming up the coast of California. But by the time they finally got there, and whatever it was, she said, late afternoon, she was so angry, she said, that she heard, heard one of them coming up, and it was Jerry Jampolsky, he came in, you know, first, and she said, where have you been? Do you see that table over there? You know, I've prepared lunch, and you, you're, you guys are more than late, you know, and didn't call, and this is, and she said, and where's Bill? And Jerry said, well, he's coming up the steps behind me, but he is so happy and high that it's, I don't know if you'll, he'll, he can hardly keep his feet on the ground. He's like Fred Astaire, you know, with Ginger Rogers, just, Dancing around, and so she was like, ah. So when he came in the door, she kind of had her hands ready like this, like to st in strangle mode, like really to get him. She was really angry at him, and but he was like all over the room because he was so happy. He was just telling about his miracles and dancing around the room. She was like following around. She said, ah, but you can't stay angry at somebody who's just in pure joy. I mean, how do you stay angry at somebody who's just joy? So then Bill had finally, after they had their meal and everything, you know, uh, Bill said, well, I've, I have forgiven my last relationship. And she's like, get out. Like, <laughs> I know you, I know you intimately. She knew all of his grievances, they talked about them all, all of them, maybe, I don't know how many, just bunches of them. And so, he insisted that he had forgiven his last relationship, so she said, I'm going to go down one by one and see every single one, because she knew them all. What about this one? No, no, it's that. He would tell the story. What about this one? Had kind of ticked off all of his uh, relationships, and she knew that there was like the ace in the hole. There was one that it was a woman that he had loved when he was much younger, that was unrequited love, that she never seemed to love him back, and he was always heartbroken about her. And that was kind of like the thorn, the one situation that was always down there for him. So when she got through all the rest, she went, ah! But what about her? And, you know, brought her up. And then she, he said, well, you know, I called her up. She said, ah, you called her? Yes, and I invited her. We went out. We shared a weekend together. You, what? You met with her? Yes, yes. And, and well, we just laughed. And it was all, I could see it was all my own faulty perception of her. She was, she was flabbergasted that he had forgiven his last relationship. She was just struck. And then, the next morning they were supposed to go to some kind of conference together, and it was a beautiful sunny day, and he just said, he was going to walk, he wanted to walk instead, and she said, don't be ridiculous, you know, it's a good, pretty good distance, and you can ride with me in my car, and he insisted, and he went off walking in the sunshine, and they found that he had laid his body aside, right next to the sidewalk, on the grass, on the, on the route. Uh, that was his uh, transition. Yeah, well, yeah. The body gently laid aside, like taking off a sweater or something, you know. Which is a very powerful story, you know, even for students of A Course in Miracles, that, that you know, he, he just basically put it into practice and he had to face that situation where he was making the exception and then finally just go, no, I, it, it can't be that, that, that this, has, this has the power to hold me back from my goal. And so, you know, it's like you just open to it and then um, through circumstances or there's always a way that that's, something happens that gives you that opportunity to kind of see the lesson, to, you know, to, to really feel the love and the joy and the connectedness that was just covered over by the grievance. Because the grievance was just a, another ego perception that was just waiting to be released. You know, there was no, there was no solidity to it. It was not really what it seemed. It just seemed to be solid, but it was just another mm -hmm. grain of sand. There was a, 
There was something in the news about a month ago, a month and a half ago, I don't, you probably heard about it, in the case in Austria where a, a father had imprisoned his daughter. Yes. And they had, so he, she had seven children of his. And that's hard to forgive. Mm. I mean, I can say, I, I can glibly say, oh, I forgive that. But doing it in here mm. is, I think it's beyond me. And I don't see how Jesus could forgive that, forgive that even. Yeah, I remember when I was in Germany, they were talking about that, that case, and they said, oh, they put it on the news, it's like it's everywhere, this man's face, and you know, and this and this and this, and it seemed to stir up a lot of things for a lot of people. Um, there was a time where Jesus was talking with Helen, and basically, I think Helen had a huge resistance to forgiving something, and basically, it was, it seemed like a mountain, like, like she came up to this solid, almost like a mountain of granite that was in front of her. And looking to go up over the mountain just seemed impossible. And even to walk around the mountain, it just seemed like a huge mountain. And Jesus basically said, just come and take my hand and we'll go through the mountain. You know, almost like just pierce through it. It seems very solid. But yet, it's just as flimsy as all the other illusions. It will, it will fade away. We can pass right through it if we're joined together. It's kind of the symbol of being joined. Yeah. And uh, and I definitely have had that. I've had like three revelatory experiences in my life where I was doing eye gazing, and the figure ground, the three dimensionality collapsed, and then this like where the figure would be, the outline this blazing light started to pour through, and then the whole world just completely disappeared into that light. It was like three very, very direct experiences of how flimsy this, this little film is. It's, it's like a, a movie. Uh, it's very, very thin, and yet it just seems, when your mind is in kind of really deep into, into the belief, it just feels like it's solid. And, and, it, and the characters seem very real in it. Um, another time, I had a friend who was like in, uh, in Florida, who he was married and uh, they were a married couple and their daughter, uh, I think she was an adopted, or she was the daughter of his wife that he had married, but still his daughter uh, had been murdered. And that they had caught the man, and they, he went through a trial, was put into prison. And my friend Jap, he, um, he basically, he had had a Course in Miracles center that he founded in her, his, his daughter's name, Lauren Quinn Center, and he'd, he'd hosted uh, attitudinal healing sessions, Course in Miracles sessions for years in this center that was named after his daughter who had been murdered. And then at some point, he was guided to go to the prison where the man was and face the man. And then the Spirit said to him, now I want you to, I want, Jap, I want you to write a book and I want you to ask this man to do the illustrations, because the man was very artistic, to put the illustrations in the book about forgiveness, the man that murdered his daughter. Wow. And, and he did, he, he ended up inviting the man, and the man drew the illustrations, and it was such a symbol of healing and forgiveness, you know, in his life. So I actually did a gathering, uh, once or twice I think, down there in the Lauren Quinn Center, actually in the center named after the daughter. But that was years ago, that was probably in the, maybe around 1992, uh, quite a number of years ago. So I went back, probably, uh, 20, or maybe about 10, over 10 years later, the center was gone, I went to visit Jap, and with all of the healing, Course in Miracles, forgiving the man who murdered his, his daughter, all this and that that had happened, I met him and his wife had met another man, a younger man, and had moved off to Greece, and when I walked in this time on him, he was he was like, I can't believe it. All these years I've worked for the Course in Miracles, I feel angry, I feel resentful, I feel jealous, you know, I feel hurt, I feel a, a victimized, you know, 
and after all the healing that I've gone through, it's almost like I've gone nowhere. David, I just, the, the rage is, is there. It was like somebody had stabbed him in the heart with a, with a dagger and was emotionally, he'd been married to her for 32 years and they'd gone through all that together and then she married, she, she went off to, uh, to Greece with this younger man. It was like somebody was turning the dagger in his heart. So, he looked at me and I said, I said, oh chap, I said, he said, what, what do you have to tell me? I said, well first of all, people are not people. First of all, I, I told him that, I, that she still loves you after everything that you've been through to think that somebody can just walk out of your life and they don't love you, that's, that's not the truth at all. She still loves you. And second of all, people are not people. People just represent our thoughts. And so, I said, so all your wife was doing was representing your thoughts. Uh, nothing more than that. So, I said, tell me some more. Well, he was about ten years older than her. He was starting to wrinkle. And she was getting facelifts and you know, a nip and tuck here. I said, ah, she was just acting out your fear of aging. Uh, that's all it was. And, and then going off to be with the younger, and I said, oh, it was perfect, you see, I was all, I could not. he was just like, oh my God, give me that dagger, you know, let's get, let's get busy here, we got, we got some joy to find. So it's like, so she was just acting it out. People are just thoughts, they really aren't real people, they just reflect thoughts in our consciousness. So, your fear of aging and your fear of death, she acted out. And, and then um, I said, and what happened to her? And he said, what? I said, she moved to Greece, like she, like she left your awareness. <laughs> I said, that's a sign, you know, a beautiful sign, your fear of aging and your fear of death <laughs> moved away, you know. <laughs> he was like, looking at me like, oh my God, I, just giving him a little reinterpretation here. I got that dagger out, and then I said, it's like, you know, what is it? that you feel so sad about. He says, well, it's like I'm lonely. I thought we would just be growing old and white together, like on Golden Pond, you know, in the movie. <laughs> and we would just be in the rocking chairs, watching the sunset over the lake, just together and everything. And this just shattered my picture of, of my retired life with my soulmate and everything. And I said, yeah, I said, but, I said, you know, he said, and I'm lonely in this house. It has all these memories and this and this and this. I said, yeah, you, I don't know that you need such a big house uh, all by yourself. And he was getting all concerned about having to go back to work and how he would manage financially. I said, yeah, I think maybe you just need to lighten up. So he said, yeah, I think maybe I could sell the house. So I went off for a walk and I met two people on a walk that were like looking for a house in the area. Oh so I came back. I mean, I move quick with the Holy Spirit. Just, uh, get the knife. Right. Get the knife out. <laughs> And let's move forward in a hurry, let's get, get the wound healed and so he was like, whoa, and I said, yeah, they're interested in the house, you might want to talk to him. And then he said he had, this had happened a little while ago, so he had this woman that he was kind of interested in. I said, oh, we should have a big gathering here at your house while you've still got your house. And so having done this healing center, he knew all these people, but he hadn't been in touch with any of them. So, me and his new friend, he called his girlfriend, and we, they called all these different people. We had this big gathering in this big house. Happiness, joy, beaming faces, photographs, his, his son came, you know, all his fam family members came. It just, we just lit that place up, you know, like a big celebration and everything. I said, here, how's that handle your loneliness? He's like, whoa, <laughs> I got a few miracles there, like we had the whole place at home. And then he was like, hmm, well, but I don't know what I'm going to do with my time. And I said, well, what, what kind of things have you always wanted to do, but you never really gave yourself the opportunity to do? And he said, well, I, I, I do like to write. And he said, I have written some fiction uh, stories, short stories. And so he showed me one of them, and it was a total miraculous story about a, it was about a casino, and there was this character who was like the Holy Spirit character that was helping them all get out of their addictions to money and greed and everything, and helping them. Uh, it was it was like a parable. He he writes these fiction stories that are really like parables for awakening, wow. but he never published them. Which I got the book or got one of them, put it on the web 
for him and you know he just he loved to do that and he had a great skill for that but he just had never given himself permission to do it. I said, oh you have great ability for this, you should do more of this. So I was there a few more days. He started to get more interested in this uh, girlfriend and she came and was there at the party and everything. Since then he's married her. Uh, so, you know, his fulfillment, he just continued on in life. He didn't like did get really sad and just go into the grave uh, with how his soulmate left him and this and that. And at the very end I said, he was I think from uh, Mississippi, a southern part of the United States. And he had a southern draw and I, I looked at him one day and I said, what is it, if you could do anything with your life, what is it that you would do? And he looked at me, he's probably, I guess at the time in his 70s with his face starting to wrinkle up, and he just said in his slow southern Mississippi drawl, go fishing, go fishing. He wanted to go fishing and I went, that's your meditation. He just wanted to put the, the boots on and the rubber things, you know, where they, he, him and a group of buddies just go out there and they just stand in the stream, <coughs> let the stream roll by, just out there losing track of time and space. That's his meditation. He didn't have to be in yoga postures and work on his breathing and all this stuff. That was his meditation, to go fishing. And so I said, you should do that, you really should. But that was just an example, again, about how for him, he, he had gone through so much forgiveness, but he was beating himself up because of this hatred and this anger and jealousy and envy that came up with this situation. But again, it was like, no, 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 no. Uh, let's, let's not go there. You know, you've come too far. I'm joining with you now to look at, at the blessing of this. The, even though it doesn't seem like a blessing in, right now, it will in the, from this higher perspective. You know, you'll be able to see it. And what joy it is for me to be able to go with, to meet with people who, I have people sometimes that call me and they're crying when they call me and they're laughing ten minutes later. It's just, it's totally miraculous. We've had some of those conversations yeah. even. Uh, so you know the power of the miracle when you can have such a turnaround from what seems to be such a dark state where everything feels like the world's closing in on you to just popping through, like you pierce through the clouds and you're back in the sunshine again. And, uh, and the, the more we teach it, the more we let the miracle just extend through us, then of course we become very convinced that if everything is love and a call for love, and we learn to recognize the calls for love, instead of perceiving them as attacks, we actually see them as calls for love, we let the love pour through us as an answer to the call for love, and then you can't extend something that you don't already have. I mean, that's how the Holy Spirit convinces us that we are love, is by extending love through us over and over, it washes away the ego. It washes away every kind of limitation that we have. Every unworthy thought that we've ever had about ourselves just gets washed away. Over and over, you know. We keep teaching what we would learn, just to keep gently just let it happen. Well, we have about 20 minutes before we have a break, so are there any more questions? Anything you'd like David to talk about? <coughs> well, we started a thing that we, with the vision board, oh. and it's funny when you're saying about cracking the opening and seeing the light, because it was actually a conversation that we had. We'd started to do these visuals, just a board, and at the beginning, we just said we'd pick images that made us feel good. And, you know, it was interesting because a few of us did it together in a kind of a fun arrangement at the house where we said we'd all put our own ideas together. And the interesting thing was one of the people had four things on their board, or maybe five, and they were very specific, exactly detailed. And then some of us had loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of those little images and there were all kinds of different things that were from scenery to um, things that we saw as beauty or joyous or laughter or people jumping for joy or big Lots. smiles and 
There's a, there's a couple of <laughs> fun ones, all right, yeah. And a bit of fashion in there as well. And we were actually having this bit of a debate afterwards to say, because there were so many different interpretations, I have to say my own was very busy, lots and lots of different images. And we, we were questioning ourselves as to would it have been the right decision? Now, there is not obviously no right or wrong, but would it have been, would it have served us better to have had five images that were very, very clear, or was it actually better to have loads of different things that just made you feel good? And talking about the cracking open of the head, we sat down after we did it, and the following day he says, you know, actually, because you'd spent all this time and merged in all these fun things that you absolutely loved, it felt like something had cracked open and the light had come in. So we were having this debate anyway amongst us, so if you can shed any light on that, we'd be delighted to take sides and go back and tell them how wrong they were. Yeah. No, there is no right and wrong. Though. Yeah, the cracking open, because it's like, that's kind of how it, it goes where, where you go for goals and aims in this world and, and there seems to be some fulfillment. It's definitely part of a training of the mind, seemingly, to just practice uh, clearing and opening to feelings of joy and happiness, but the forms, the specific forms, whether there seems to be many or even a few, but the forms are always the bringers of the answer to prayer, that in the sense of, of using symbols that are still meaningful to the perceiver. So that's why some people see, you know, angels or the Mother Mary appear, and in India it might be, you know, an elephant or a goat or something like this. It's something completely different. But, uh, so the prayer, it's like the, the specific forms are the bringers in form to the emotional experience that the mind is asking for. And so, that's important. Once you begin to see that, you see that that's always, whatever you seem to experience in this world is always answering the prayer of the heart. Or, you know, how it says, God, God knows the prayer of your heart before a word is spoken. Before you even utter the words and say, I want this, or please help me with this or that. And this is good because you get clear on cause and effect, that you start to see that the images and the objects, whether there's a few of them or a lot of them, are, are part of this tapestry of images and symbols that the Spirit is using uh, to lead you, to guide you to that innermost spot in your heart, which is just pure joy and happiness and contentment. It's like step by step using the symbols to take you in deeper beyond the symbols. So in that context, uh, you can understand everything much more clearly that whenever we pray for specifics, which like in the, the movie The Secret and the vision boards and so forth, where people had a lot of s symbols of getting exactly the house that they had envisioned or exactly the partner and so forth. Um, but whenever you do this imaginary thing where you're trying to imaginate, imagine something that you want, it's still looking at the script and saying, out of all of these possibilities, I want to focus in on or narrow down on this particular object or outcome or event that I really want to draw into my awareness. <coughs> Whereas the deeper you go spiritually, you start to realize that, that the script is written and that the idea of trying to uh, pick out a specific thing that you want is like picking something out of the past and drawing it out and focusing on it and saying, I want to have this again in the future, which actually maintains the wheel of imaginary time. And Krishnamurti was probably one of the great beings uh, of, of our, of the recent century, who, who talked about that. Uh, whenever you desire something specifically, you like, you're anticipating it and you're wanting it to come forward into your awareness in the future, and that's how the time, the movement of time unfolds, is, is wanting the past to be repeated in some way that is desirable. Thinking, of course, you know what's best and what is most desirable. So that's how the, the perpetuation of time goes on. And eventually, you start, like with my friend Les, you know, you start getting more and more to the sense of, of okay, I want a state of mind. That's what's my 
I'm going to use the power of my mind for. I want a state of peace or joy or freedom or happiness or however you think of it. enough, the, the more, when we began the process, which was selecting the images, versus placing the images actually onto the board, it was a, a huge shift. Because you started off with loads and loads of things that were maybe more about material items. And actually when it came to putting the things on the board, they were more about feelings, experiences, um, you know, like you might have an image of a person on a mountain, you know, with the clouds and, and the expansiveness, and that would attract you more than, you know, when it actually came down to it, we started with loads of photographs of things, and they're the things that ended up getting shifted. There was a couple of things, but it was much more about the actual experience and the freedom and the, the sensation of joy and the, the sharing and the that type of thing was more poignant when it came to actually making a decision about placing this. So it was quite an interesting process in itself between where it began and where it finished. Yeah. And now it's just a pretty thing to look at. You know, now it's just something that actually you get a bit of joy of looking at. And if you're in a moment of disturbance with yourself or out of alignment with yourself, when you look at it, and one of the images that I have that's central, which is interesting because when we placed them we did it quite quickly because the kids were coming in and there was pictures everywhere and glue and glitter and we're thinking the kids are going to have a field day and all our pictures are going to be everywhere so it was quite a quick but I noticed that the hand, there's a beautiful hand which looks like a spiritual image that's in the centre of the board and, and the actual layout of it is quite um, miraculous when you look at it as a whole because it, never, it was never originally in my head that that was, that was going to be a process of choice. Yeah. But it ended up being something completely different. But now it's just something when you're having those moments, you look at it and you think, that really gives me a lovely feeling. It makes me feel good. And it doesn't give me, because there's not all this material stuff in it, it doesn't give me any of that jarring of, oh, I haven't achieved this, or there's none of that experience with it. It's more about, oh, it's, it feels good to look at this. Yeah. It has a, a nice calm, calm in the feet. Yeah. Know? Like a reminder of the experience. And a reminder of what I'm chasing. Yeah. You know, of, not what, of what I'm choosing. So that if there's something that's out of balance, it's like, hey, this is what I'm choosing, this makes me feel good, this is where I'm going to continue yeah. to, yeah. you know, follow in that yeah. route. But it was, it was a it's fun a and interesting place. experience. And everyone, doing it together as a group, made it a lot of laughs, you know. It was yeah. a, a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Beautiful example. And, and it does seem to that people open up and progress. I know, I just recently heard that they, for decades they've been surveying Americans on what's, what their top priority is, and it's always been one answer, money, 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 money. And this year they said for the first time something took the number one spot away from money. <laughs> for the first time in decades, free time. Uh, free time, just the sound of it, you know, freedom to, use time in a helpful way, you know, it's like a movement away from this kind of obsession with material things and getting and so forth. So, you know, it's, those are all just symbols of like spiritual evolution where, oh yeah, we've tried, we tried it with a lot of the toys and everything and now, you know, we're getting, we're getting zooming in to, to what's really meaningful, what's really va truly valuable, what we want to, you know, hold on to in our awareness. I think uh, Jesus said, <clears throat> with all thy getting, get understanding. Yeah. And, and that will give you everything, wouldn't it? Yeah. If you understand. Yeah. So. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Peace and understanding. Jesus says, peace and understanding go together and cannot mm -hmm. be found apart. So, mm -hmm. so it, it's not the understanding of the world in terms of how things work or analytical understanding, but but that wisdom, you know, mm -hmm. that wisdom that's, that's in our hearts, that's all-knowing, that yeah. knows all the answers and has always known them. That's where we find the peace. It's like you, you really do start to just let go, yield away all those associations of what you think you know what anything means. Um, and I've had so many of those experiences, it seems more and more surreal or feel very light-hearted, but, but uh, you just don't value and hold on to those old meanings anymore. You just, your mind's making way for the new. Like Jesus says, you know, you can't put, you know, new wine into old wineskins. Yeah. You can't keep using these old paradigms and, mm -hmm. 
and judgments and categories that have been around for centuries, uh, if we're going to really experience consistent joy. So the, the old just seems to fall away. Even with relationships, I mean, I think, you know, we've always thought of relationships in terms of bodies, frequency of contact, uh, people will say, yes, but how much quality time do we spend together, you know, those have been kind of our barometers. But now, it's like the mankind and the whole human race is ready for an evolution into what uh, Jesus calls holy relationship, which is all based on giving and extending, and it's not based on getting, or owning, or possessing. Uh, it's not, it's not like a codependency, it's dependency on God for everything, where you fall in love with God, and then therefore you fall in love with, with everyone based on that. And it's a very different uh, way of, of looking and perceiving. Uh, it's like, uh, like there's a, there's a family therapist in the United States named John Bradshaw, and he, he did, uh, he drew, drew it out one time as a mathematical equation, which was, on the blackboard, one half plus one half equals one. Uh, that's kind of the old paradigm. You know, find your other half, find your soulmate, find the one that will complete you, will give you that one, that wholeness. And John Bradshaw said, well the only problem is it's not a plus sign in the equation, it's a multiplication sign. <laughs> one half times one half equals one fourth. <laughs> you feel, <laughs> you feel worse than ever <laughs> in that kind of paradigm. You feel like you're lacking, now you feel dependent, shaky, unworthy, you know, you, you don't have stability. So he, he said, it is a multiplication sign, but then he, t he erased it and he put in one times one equals one. You've got to come from a state of wholeness. You've got to come from a state of knowing that you're loved and connected, that you have all this love to give and share. Then you meet a partner who reflects that, and you both come from a place of giving and sharing, not give and take, or you know, trying to balance things out. You know, as if uh, we both have to work hard, and we both have to make the best of this and this and that, to more of just coming from a place of wholeness, and seeing that wholeness reflected around you. So, I think, you know, of all places, that's really where the, the paradigm shift from the ego's use of setting this world up on specialness and trying to find fulfillment in special love. Jesus spends nine chapters in the book talking about special hate relationships and special love relationships, and there's no topic that gets more uh, words or more attention than that of relationships. So, it's like in traditional spirituality, it was like emphasizing meditation and service, perhaps. Uh, now, Jesus is saying, okay, we can bring relationships into the, the realm of spirituality, but you need careful training, because the ego wants to use the relationships for its purposes, to keep you sleeping, to keep you guilty, you know, to keep you feeling like you, you gave and you gave and you gave and never got anything back. There must have been something faulty going on in your mind, because giving and receiving are the same. <laughs> so if you feel like you gave and gave and didn't receive what you were giving, it's not the partner's fault, it's the perception, it's, it's what's going on in your mind that has you still looking to receive something. And if you look at the prayers of St. Francis and Mother Teresa and so forth, there's always an emphasis on the giving and the extending. You know, make me an instrument of your peace, you know. I want to love rather than to be loved, you know, instead of looking to be loved, looking for a partner or for people to adore you and love you and this and that, to get into the, the, the giving aspect of just, for the joy of it, just giving, 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 like the flower gives its fragrance, you know, it doesn't tell the wind where to blow, the fragrance, blow it to that cow but not to that goat, or, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't tell the wind how to use the gift. It, it just gives the gift and lets the wind carry, you know, to wherever. And I think that's just, in human relationships, that's just a, a very uh, new kind of concept, because it's like, oh no, I will direct uh, the fragrance to where it's to go, and you know, and there's a lot of expectations that come in with that, and people can feel quite locked in uh, 
in that way. So sometimes a girl gets frightened. <laughs> you know, it's like, what, what, why, am I re why are these things coming towards me? What a beautiful scent. <laughs> yeah. Am I worthy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's what I've seen in, in that. You know, when I tried to dem demonstrate in my life that kind of love and giving the freaked out nature. Sometimes people accept things and they're they're quite delighted, and then they're just wondering, what's the catch? Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. You know, mm. yeah, and maybe sometimes with me, maybe there is a catch. Maybe I am trying to get something, but a lot of the times I wasn't. But they, they still were wondering, yeah. you know, and that time showed them that there wasn't. But yeah. it was interesting at the beginning. Yeah. yeah, it's quite a, it's quite an art in the sense of um, Gary Fromm wrote a book years ago, The Art of Loving. It's like because the spirit knows what's best in every situation, we're back to that inner listening and being tuned into the spirit because. And to, unless you're tuned in, then... Yes, inappropriate giving too, I would accept yeah. that. <laughs> I mean, sometimes the most you can offer someone is like a smile. I mean, that's the absolute maximum. If you go beyond a smile, if you go over to hug them, they're like rigid, like mm. there's too much fear. Yeah. And that's why it's so important to become more and more intuitive, because the spirit knows what is best in every situation. Yeah. When the ego tries to get in there and and, oh, I know what's best here, then it, you get mixed results. <laughs> oh yeah, very you mixed. Get some I, very I funny. got that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've, we've got a sort of philosophy, if you like, in Freemasonry, which is uh, based on something that Charles Lamb once said, do good, do good by stealth and be found out by accident. And a lot of people actually find that quite difficult to cope with. Give me an example. I mean, I, one of my things is I like to so I mean, papers on people's desks and not tell them I gave them to them, things like that. A friend of mine said, no, I want them to save me. And I said, why? What, how would that make that act any better for you because you've received gratitude back? If you don't, if you don't for the right reasons, you don't need gratitude. Yeah. And that's exactly the same thing, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's very much like the Bible about don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. I mean, it's, it's the same principle. Or I think in 12-step programs, they, they emphasize anonymous and anonymity. Uh, because the ego just wants to jump onto this idea of giving. Oh, yeah. And then giving for, uh, for recognition, for attention, you know, it will just bring in a whole bunch of other motives for the giving. In fact, I, I participated years ago in a, in a project called uh, uh, the, it was like a Christmas, the holiday project or whatever, which was, the slogan was, you are the gift. So even though we would go to nursing homes and, and to hospitals and so on and so forth, to sit and talk with people or to bring them cookies or take animals in for them to, to pet or whatever, it was like the slogan was always, remember, you are the gift, who you are. Your state of mind that you share is the gift, it's not in whatever you're doing. Don't get caught up in the task. And I kept hearing that from the Holy Spirit all along. It would be like, David, it's the, the message is important, not the messenger. And uh, so when I first was starting to do this and, and the miracles were pouring through me, a friend of mine wanted me to speak at a big national Course in Miracles conference in the United States. And the director, the man setting the whole thing up, said, could you send a resume? And some people around me were like laughing, they were going, resume? You don't even have a resume. And he said, could you send a photo? They said, you used all your photos for healing, you don't even have any photos hanging around. Uh, and when I did put something together just to send off to him, uh, to answer his, his request, uh, it got lost in the mail. Uh, it was like, uh, and, and the Spirit said, I rem reminded me again, they said, the Spirit said, you will not have a spiritual career. Uh, that was what I was told again, I would not sell anything and I will not have a spiritual career. Almost like you've done that before, do you want to wake up or are you going to go back to this thing again? So even the game of writing books and doing publicity and, you know, flying around and blah, 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 and doing talk shows and this and this and this. It's very sneaky. You can, it can turn into a profession again and before you know it, you've got, you've got something to do, an image to maintain, uh, something that's got to be protected. 
something that's expected of you or that you expect others, you know, I've heard people say, well, I can't come there unless I've, there's 50 people there or I can't come without sufficient numbers and this and that. That's, that's when you're getting into a spiritual career. You know, the ego has just hopped right on the old spiritual journey and said, great, let's turn it into a career and, you know, and, and for me, one time I was asked to write a, an article for a magazine called On Course, which was, had a wide distribution, Course in Miracles magazine. And the man, my friend John Mundy, who was the editor, said, write, a, write an article please, and then send in a photograph again. And my friend said, you don't have photographs, you use them all in your healing process of bringing up all your intensity and, and then you just threw them all away once, once they, and she didn't have a charge on any of the photographs, it was like, ha, no purpose for them anymore. And I said, I know, somebody snapped a picture of me and my friend Beverly when we were hopping in a car in front of, before one of our trips. So I sent that photo in, and it just came out as figure ground, black and white. In the magazine, you couldn't see the facial expressions. Uh, no, to turn. <laughs> yeah, it was, exactly, there was nothing there. You couldn't see eyes or nose or anything. And again, the spirit's like, mm hmm, yeah. the message, the message, the article was fine. <laughs> it was just figure ground, you know, and I was, you know, this was early on when I was just working with the Course, so it was like the, the spirit was like giving me very strong messages, like, do not go down these distractive roads. Uh, truth is simple, and you want this experience of it, and truth doesn't involve numbers, it's not about uh, reaching a threshold of so many people in the world believing something a certain way. He said, no, no, truth is here and now. Uh, truth, the truth is an experience that you can open up and have right now. You don't have to wait until you cross a, a threshold or something in the future. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, not going. That's it. That's easy. Right at the end. Yeah, end. yeah, yeah that's yeah, the punchline. Punch am, I, am, I am I alive? Am I dead? We don't have to think like that yeah. anymore. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. But the answer is like that. Well, from the ego's perspective, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the little it's child was in a there. Room, the two, no, no, not that bit. Her and him, and I was like, took back into the same. Like. <laughs> 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 yeah, they left the suicide out. Yeah. So it's gone. But he died instead. He went, you know, well, he why, why if he'd gone and not felt guilty that she died. He didn't die. Well, he did. He, he said he went back when well, he went back to go back for her. He forgave he himself for that. Nobody died. Don't you get it? Nobody died. 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 Nobody so long, the planet was loving. Yeah. <laughs> the humans, no. <laughs> no, the planet was giving the opportunity for the humans, but I didn't know that they resolved anything for themselves. I didn't feel that way. Well, I mentioned that at the very beginning about him. He's chopping, 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 and he cuts his finger. Yeah, he was healed to the so end. So that scene did come around again, where he's chopping, 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 and he, he seems to cut his finger, but there's no... No blood, which was kind of a, just a little symbol. But if it had ended there, then that would have been fine. But why did she come in at the end? I know you genuinely didn't get... She, she except for Hollywood, you see, changing something to make it. Well, she had to deliver her lines. That, that's my point, though. He was forgiven <laughs> in the healing. Yeah. But is it because, oh, people might get that, let's have her walk in at the end of the stage? <laughs> <laughs> well, seriously, because I, I studied film, I worked in film. Yeah, business, I've done so that. I was like, too. I don't need that. What's that about? I've like, done that. I, I chop off ends of films too, and it reaches the crescendo. This, 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 where, the, this <laughs> where the producers <laughs> came in and said they would get that. So we yeah. they re the end, end, or re film the ending. They yeah. do party reviews where they bring it, show it to people, when people weren't happy enough watching this film, would change the ending. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. So I'm just they curious. As to but the, everything is forgiven. That was just so she could deliver <laughs> her line. Everything is forgiven. In other words, it's all, it's all forgiven. And then we don't have to think like that anymore. In other words, there still is one trail of a question: Am I dead? Am I alive? You know. But yeah. but birth and death are inventions of the ego. Yeah. Uh, the ego made up the the realm of time and space. It made up the bodies. It invented birth. It invented death. And I, I was sharing at breakfast. The Course says, the ego will pursue you beyond the grave. Uh, you can't just die. It's like those Freddy Krueger movies. 
<laughs> no, you know, that keep coming back yeah. and threatening and threatening, you know, you can't, it's never going to stop until you see that it's silly, that, that love is all that there is and there could never be an ego uh, that could tell you to be something that you're not, you know, you could never take it seriously that, that there's anything other than love. So I, that's what I thought was nice about, you know, we don't have to think like that anymore, but, mm -hmm. but in order to not think like that, you just have to give up everything you think you know about everything in the world, you know, nothing, birth and death and bodies and growth and even our concepts of spirituality, you know, reincarnation, that's got to go eventually. And then I tell people, the Course has got to go, you've, you've got to get to a point where you go, look at the Course and you go, okay, uh, out with that too, because the truth can't be explained or described. It's just, it's an experience that's beyond the words. And the, the words are just set almost like a, like one of those trampolines that you can just go <laughs> boing and jump on and then go springing, springing beyond them to the, to the point where you don't need the words anymore. And it does say that in, the, in Lesson uh, 189, forget this world, forget this course and come with open arms unto your God. You know, it's just a beautiful in invitation to, to go beyond the, the symbols and beyond the words. And even when we talk about it, it's like a holy scripture, you know, it's like, well, let's remember, he says, words are but symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. Ah, oh, that's a good clue about how putting words in their place, no matter how poetic and how beautiful they are, they're symbols of symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. So they're, they're concrete symbols that represent thoughts, which are still symbols, which are still twice removed, you know, it's, it's once removed from reality because reality is abstract, it doesn't have any form, there's no specifics in reality, it's just pure love. So that's why we're, we're using the specifics, but we also keep in mind, hmm, I look forward to the day when I can just say, okay, thank you book. You've served me very well, now I can, can just shine my light and be the truth, not, uh, you know, have to quote it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You said um, yesterday, when I said about create your own reality, you had a different words, but I, something about, something about your own illusion. Project your own illusion. Yeah, I love <coughs> Yeah, that's great, because then you can enjoy all the stuff with the secret and, and, uh, you know, the um, Abraham material and on and on, there's so much stuff, but, with, but it's kind of more of a catchphrase now. It's almost like the next, next step in human evolution is you create your own reality, and then beyond that is, oh, I projected my own illusion, and thank God that there's something greater than the illusion that's waiting for me. It's, it's actually, instead of me seeking love, it's nice to think of it as love is seeking me. <coughs> wow! Love is seeking me, and I know that what it seeks is what it finds. Uh, love's on a seek mission, and it's going to find you, and there's nothing you can do. You can play hide and seek <laughs> uh, if you want in time and space, but, but love is too powerful. It's, it's, it's the only reality there is, and it will find you. And in the end, it's almost like, isn't that fun? Even when you're dating, you know, when you're being pursued, isn't it fun to be caught? <laughs> okay, you can have me. <laughs> then imagine that that's what's going on. <laughs> that love is seeking you, and finally you go, "All right, you got me. I'm yours." You know. That was a Kenny Loggins song. He, Kenny Loggins did a song called "Forever," and the very end of the song is, uh, "Always thought I'd be, I'd be yours," and then the song just goes higher and higher and ends with this glorious crescendo, what, forever in my life always thought I'd be, I'd be yours, which is really a song to God, kind of saying in the end, I'm yours, you created me, yeah. uh, I'm yours, um, and I could never be anything other than yours, and it's like that true loyalty. In this world, you know, there's so much about interpersonal loyalty, you know, our fidelity, loyalty, trust, but those are all just uh, practice grounds for really being loyal to God. And how would you be loyal to God but except being happy? If God created you happy, then the best way to be loyal is to be happy. And it's so simple to think, oh my God, that's what God's will for me is perfect happiness. 
God created me to be happy, and when I'm happy, I'm honoring God by saying thank you for creating me happy. And so, it's just that the ego is so frightened of that love that it makes up its own versions of happiness. Like happiness games. But when you follow the games, you're never happy. I mean, they're, they're called happiness games, but, but they don't really make you happy. Once you've achieved the goal of the happiness game in the world, or you think you've got there, there's always something back there going, maybe I could be more happy. <laughs> Which means that it can't be true happiness, because you could never be more happy than, than you were created. That would be impossible. So it's just like, uh, we try fame and fortune and money and possessions. We try interpersonal relationships and children and, and even setting up healing centers. And uh, Somebody asked me one time, well, if you're so awake and happy and joyful and enlightened, how, how many uh, enlightened students do you have? Like, <laughs> I want to quantify enlightenment, like, five, ten, fifteen, you know? <laughs> What's your quota? What have you produced? You know, how many happy teachers have you produced if you're so happy? And I said, well, it's just, it's all one mind. It's not really quantifiable in terms of that, you know, and it goes past all this stuff for centuries about disciples and devotees. It's just a state of mind. Persons don't get enlightened. You may think about Buddha or Krishna or Jesus or this and this, but, but, the, but if you take person, personality, persona, you follow it back to the Latin, persona is mask. How can you have an enlightened mask? I mean, that makes no sense to me. Buddha was enlightened, Jesus was enlightened, even, you have to go beyond the traditional teachings that, that would say that there's human beings that reach the stage of enlightenment, when it's actually the mask never reaches the state of enlightenment. And people have been talking now for centuries about the second coming of Christ. When is Jesus going to come back? They were all excited in the first century. We're, it's close. He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. First century, no. Second century, no. Third century, it's at hand, it's at hand, no. Fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, St. Francis. This kingdom of heaven, it's close. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, you know. You know, it's when you forgive the world and you wake up and you see that you are the Christ, that's the second coming of Christ. It's not that some man is going to come back with long hair and blue eyes and walk on water or walk on the clouds and say, come up here with me. I will rescue you from the world, like some people believe, you know, that it just kind of lifts people up in the rapture. They'll be sewing or knitting or out in the fields, and all of a sudden their bodies will just start to go up. <laughs> Thank you! Oh, oh. How many centuries does it take? 495? Well, I'm happy. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be like the body is just raising up into the sky. It's like, You've got to forgive the world, do your inner work, and accept yourself as the living Christ. And then that's the second coming of Christ. There really is no first or second, but, but in those terms, wouldn't that be, of course, the second coming of Christ, is when, when you realize it for yourself, that you're the one. That's the story of the Matrix, you are the one. You know, Neo, you re rearrange the Neo letters, you get one. Which is what Morpheus, his teacher, was telling him, you're the one. And that's what Jesus is telling us in the Course, you are the living Christ. And you've just forgotten it, and you've fallen asleep, and you're wearing a mask, and you, you're playing small. When you're huge, you're vast beyond comparison. You're magnitude, magnitude absolute magnitude, created as magnitude, uh, as God created you. So, practically speaking, I mean, we were having an interesting discussion at the breakfast table, because I, I was sharing a parable about, I mean, if you really want to go into the deepest realm, you do have to get into this thing called hypotheticals. Uh, all of history is hypothetical, and all of the future is hypothetical, and really, we were talking yesterday that the present moment is the only time that there is, but to human beings that just sounds very, like, wishful thinking. Like, sentimentally that sounds good, like, wow. I would love to have my state of mind know that the present moment is all that there is. Because practically speaking, you would have no more problems. Uh, if you knew that you live only in the present moment, time couldn't touch you. You know, the ego could try to zap you with 
past guilt and it would be like having a shield where all these arrows come and you've got this armor on. You've got your present moment armor on and all these arrows from the past come firing you. Clink, 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 clink. You can't penetrate the armor. And then the ego tries to fire future worries and concerns. Clink, 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 clink. Your armor is too strong because you're so in the present moment that the arrows from the past and the future can't penetrate the armor. That's what Eckhart Tolle is talking about with the power of now. You know, if you really live in the now, you are invulnerable. Invulnerable? How's that for a word that describes yourself? Most people don't use that word. Even some throughout history might have thought, Hitler might have thought he was invulnerable, but it proved otherwise. Uh, Napoleon was marching up here through Belgium, where Belgium is, and Waterloo. No, <laughs> sorry, you're not going to rule the world, you know. The little man and the horse. <laughs> nope. Stop. <laughs> it's as far as you go. You know, in this world, no, there is no invulnerability in this world. There's no person that's invulnerable. And even the idea of power, when we talk about power like, like a president or a, a dictator or, a, you know, you think of Eva Peron or Vita, you think of presidents and kings and like rulers, Caesar, and you can go through history and everything. I think we could look at something like, well, well, is political power really power? Of course not. God didn't create political power. There's nothing powerful about <coughs> politics. Uh, what about military power? Nuclear weapons. Uh, now they're working on Star Wars, shooting missiles out of the sky and, and all kinds of high technology. Uh, they invented some kind of a an invisible ray that they can fire, that, that human beings feel pain with now, but it, it doesn't permanently harm them, it just makes them, yeah, it's like, it's like a gun that they fire to kind of break up uh, uh, rebellions or, uh, yeah. to use with potential uh, rebellions or right. things like that. It's like they keep coming up with new weapons, inventing more and more weapons, and, but military power is an oxymoron too. I mean, people have always joked that military intelligence is an oxymoron, right. you know. Sure. That's always been the running joke, that that's a contradiction in terms, military intelligence. But military power, 